word to learn more of you. We do ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us, teach us, lead us, uh, as we try to open not only our minds but our hearts to you. Protect us from going in wrong directions, but teach us more of you and of your Son, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. John, would you crank up the camera there? It's going. Oh, it is. <laughs> Old Testament theology. Today we are talking about theology of creation. This is the whole outline of, of the course. If you don't have one of these, see me at the break and I can get you a copy of it. These are all the things that we're pursuing. Um, the introduction to Old Testament theology we talked about, theology of God was last week. This week it's theology of creation. Um, the, and we'll go on from here. Next week is going to be a busy week because we're going to talk about theology of the covenant. Covenant theology is very much the orientation that Anderson has taken in his book because he talks primarily about the various covenants. Uh, the, there are the Adamic covenant, the Noah covenant, uh, Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, and others. But we're going to talk about covenant theology. When I first started the class, in the introduction, I told you there were two theologians who in the uh, mid-20th century really revived Old Testament theology. Between uh, the start of the 20th century and mid-20th century, Old, Old Testament theology pretty much stopped being done because skepticism and the documentary hypothesis and, and competing theologies like process theology had pretty much pushed Old Testament theology as a discipline of study off the map. Well, it made a return significantly due to the work of Ike Rode and Von Rod, and those two theologians, both of them publishing in the 60s, really brought Old Testament theology back as a legitimate discipline that people thought was worth pursuing. Ike Rode was the one who really focused on covenant as the major theme of theology for the Old Testament. And so we're going to really do an Icrodian kind of approach next week when we talk about covenant theology. Then theology of fallen redemption, of law, of revelation, and then the last week, eighth week, we're going to talk about the Old Testament fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. All right? But today we want to talk about the theology of creation. The patristic fathers had a much more comprehensive biblical doctrine of creation or theology of creation than has generally existed since the 18th century advent of scientism. Now there's at least four things in that statement I need to explain to you. The patristic fathers were the leaders of the church immediately after the apostles. The very earliest of these were men who had been actually taught by the apostles. People like Polycarp of Smyrna and Irenaeus. Well, Irenaeus was taught by Polycarp. But there were several who actually had been disciples or students of the apostles. They are called the apostolic fathers as opposed to the apostles. Okay. Then the immediate next generation, you, we, we just begin to call them the church fathers. We talk about the early church fathers, the late church fathers. But these are the early, the early several generations following the apostles where the leadership of the church came into the hands of people who had not themselves known Jesus. All right? Patristic fathers, patristic, it's, it's actually a little bit redundant because patristic means the fathers. The patristic fathers or the early church fathers are the ones who significantly defined church theology or Christian theology. While we have the writings of the apostles in scripture, a number of them, Matthew was written by an apostle, um, Luke was not an apostle, Mark was not an apostle, John was, and John, John the Evangelist wrote both the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, so we have his writing. But with the exception of the, of the Gospel of John, most of the writing by the, uh, in the New Testament is not theological writing per se. Paul gets into some theological writing. Romans is a great theological treatise. But often they're so focused in terms of dealing with the particulars in Paul's writing of a certain church that was experiencing certain, uh, certain problems or challenges or difficulties that they don't constitute sort of a systematic approach to articulating what is it we believe. Um, theology is a process of, of it, it literally means you know, the, to, to articulate the word of God, the theologos. And so theology, as we understand it today, really started happening under the patristic fathers more than it did under the apostles. Now it was based upon the teaching of the apostles. It was based upon the writing of scripture. It was based upon the tradition of understanding that was passed down from Jesus to the apostles 
to the apostolic fathers, to the early church fathers beyond them. Okay. So when we talk about patristic theology, we mean the first people who came along after Jesus and the apostles, who actually began to write theology as a way of letting the church know, here's what we believe. That's why the creeds started happening. You know, there was a, a the Apostles' Creed began in the first century, really took the form pretty close to what we know today in the, the second century, in the 150 or so. The Nicene Creed, the second great creed of the church, came along in the early 300s at the Council of Nicaea. So those creeds were sort of articulations of the theology that the early church fathers or patristic fathers had begun to articulate. Does that make sense? Getting into a little church history here, but it's important for us to know where did where did this stuff get written down? Who figured this stuff out after the actual New Testament Bible times? Right. So one of the things, and, and, and I say here, the biblical doctrine of creation or the theology of creation uh, was much more complex in under the patristic fathers than most of us think about it today. Most Christians today, if you ask them about uh, a doctrine of creation or a theology of creation. They would say, well, God made everything out of nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing, ex nihilo, we're talking about that, and he did it in six days, then he rested, whatever, whatever a day means, okay, and we disagree on that. And the idea of a, of a theology of creation doesn't go much further, whereas it was very clearly articulated in the early church fathers that creation was important, the doctrine of creation, or the theology of creation, was very important. So we're going to talk today about some of what the patristic fathers would have considered a legitimate doctrine of creation and what I think we need to regain as Christians that we don't usually have. Now the second point here is that the Hebrew story of creation is unlike other creation myths or stories during that time period or in, ancient, in the ancient Near East. I've said before, Israel, when they came into the land of Canaan, they you know, they weren't the first people there. Theirs was not the first civilization. Their belief in Yahweh God was not the first God that was recognized. Other cultures or um, nations at that time had their own creation myths, their own idea about how the world came to be because a natural human experience is, boy, I wonder how all this happened. And ancient, other ancient cultures had their own ideas. Now, there is a fundamental difference, however, between the Hebrew story of creation that we have in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and every other creation myth from other cultures. Now, you'll hear liberal scholars or, um, well, liberal scholars, sometimes will say things like, well, you know, the creation story in Genesis. There are other creation stories. There are creation stories that were written down before Genesis was written. We believe Genesis was written in the 1400s B.C. There, is, uh, there are other writings that are more ancient than that. And so they say, oh, well, you know, Genesis just copied it. But there are fun, here's the point, there are fundamental differences. They are not just the same. They are, uh, there's, they're, for instance, and I say this here, every other creation myth starts with trying to explain how the gods came to be. What's called a theogony. Theogony means the start of the gods. How, how the gods started. The Hebrew story of creation assumes, without explaining any of that, or trying to explain any of that, that there was a creator God that existed. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, there's an assumption there, created the heaven and the earth. Uh, so that's one thing, is the Hebrew myth assumes the existence of a creator God. The other creation myths go to great length to try to explain how the gods got there first, and then what they did to create. Um, a couple of words that are useful. Theogony, I just mentioned. The theogony means, boy, that's a, a really piercing sound. <laughs> um, it has to be for us. Okay. The, uh, theogony means how the gods came to be, how the gods got started. Cosmogony means how did the cosmos or the universe start and then you get the word cosmology which you're more likely to have heard cosmology has to do with the understanding of the nature of the universe and it may include some of its beginning cosmogony and cosmology those two words admittedly get confused uh, 
for instance, in, in the argument for the exist arguments from uh, for the existence of God, one of the arguments for the existence of God is the cosmological argument. Well, that's a misnomer. It actually should be the cos uh, cosmogonical uh, argument. I'll get into that stuff later. Uh, so, theogony, how did the gods start? Cosmogony, how did the cosmos or the universe start? Cosmology, what is the nature of the universe, including how did it get started? That's wrapped into it. In every other ancient creation myth or epic story, the gods came from somewhere. Then they were in conflict with one another. And because of the gods, multiple gods, being in conflict, they ended up out of that conflict creating the universe as we know it. For instance, at the bottom here, I mentioned the um, Babylonian creation epic called the Enuma Elish. And if you read anything about ancient literature, this is one of the documents um, from the ancient Akkadian Babylonian uh, time period. It's from the 18th century BC, which means it was probably written about 400 years before Moses wrote the book of Genesis. So this is 400 years older, as best we know. You know, there's, all, there's always a, has to be a dose of humility on this stuff, because we don't know exact things. Um, we believe the Enuma Elish was written about 1800 BC, and it depicts a hierarchy of competing gods. That they're, the gods are fighting each other. These gods had been born out of the waters of chaos. There was this water, chaotic water kind of thing, and then out of that, somehow, the gods developed, came out, and developed personalities and became identified as individual gods. Out of those waters of chaos, one of the gods was the god Marduk. And he becomes the creator god because he fights against the goddess Tiamat. And in fighting against her, he tears her in two. Half of Tiamat creates the heavens. The other half of Tiamat creates the earth. And various other pieces of Tiamat's anatomy become various aspects in, co in the cosmos creation. Okay. Now, there are several differences between the Hebrew story of creation and that. One, they're trying to explain where the gods came from in the first place. There are multiple gods. The gods are in conflict with each other, and you get always the sense in which the gods are struggling to try to get control over each other and also control over the natural environment, the materials of nature that they're working with in order to try to create the world. That is fundamentally different than the creation story that says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There is no sense of anything but one God. There is no need to explain where God came from. There is no sense in which God was in conflict with anybody, or even that God was having trouble with the natural material of the universe. So, if you ever read, well, there are other creation stories, and Genesis probably got copied from that. They are different in kind. It's not, it's not just a different version. They are fundamentally different. It is, it is fish and fowl, okay, from the, the Hebrew story. Any question about that? We start out with the understanding that the Hebrew story of creation is fundamentally unique, different in its sense. All right, I want to spend a few minutes now talking about in the Hebrew story of creation, which is found in Genesis particularly, but then is, is reiterated throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. I'm going to be quoting some New Testament scriptures uh, today as well because they, they further support the themes that we're going to be talking about. Um, Psalm 104, quite a few other places where, where the, the principles that are exp expressed in Genesis, the first uh, chapters of Genesis, do get reiterated later. The first point I want to make today is that there is a distinction made in the Hebrew story of creation, or the theology of creation, between the creator and creation. And this has a lot of ramifications. One of the, the new agey things that happened in the world today um, that, that's very popular is this idea, I believe, of confusing the creator from the thing he create, with the thing he created. God intended, point number two up here, God intended for creation to be something distinctly not, uh, distinct in itself, different than God. The creator made a creation specifically that is not the same as he is. Now, you go, well, duh, some of this stuff may seem obvious to you, but what, if you get into studying it, you realize how often that mistake has been made. God made a creation that was not like him in that it was not infinite, it was not eternal, 
In no other way was it divine. And yet there have been philosophies down through history that have tried to purport that creation and the creator are the same, or at least are overlapping. Two of them I list here that are most, most directly this are pantheism and panentheism. If you don't know those words, pantheism means everything that we experience in the created world is God. That if you add up everything in the created world, that's what God is. Creation is equal to the creator. This is a, this is a very old philosophy that gets expressed now in various kinds of new age movements. You'll hear people say, the God who is in the trees and the clouds and the birds and the flowers. That's pantheism. That's not Christianity and it's not Judaism. That's antithetical to the belief that is taught in the Bible. You then have panentheism, which is a slight variation on that. What it says is if you add up all the stuff in the world, that plus something else is God. So panentheism says everything is part of God. All of the creation is part of God, but then God has some aspects that are bigger than creation. That, too, is not the Judeo-Christian belief. That's not the biblical belief. And yet, those things, while they are ancient philosophies, get represented, as I just told you, the God who is in the flowers and the trees and the birds and the rocks and the trees. And, you know, that We hear that today. And most of us, because we do not have any longer, since the, the age of the beginning of scientism, 18th century um, uh, scientific revolution, we forget what a good doctrine of theology, a good uh, uh, creation, a good theology of creation needs to be. And I mentioned scientism a minute ago. Let me actually go back to that. I didn't explain it. That number one, the, the biblical doctrine or theology of creation has, that we have today that has existed since the 18th century advent of scientism is not what the early church fathers did. Scientism is not the same as science. Just like uh, Islamism is not the same as Islam. You get that difference? Have you heard that description? Uh, when you add that ism on the end of it, it means it's a radical commitment to. Scientist, I, I love science. You know, I studied science. I was thinking I would become a doctor for a long, long time, and then I realized I couldn't do all the other fun stuff in college if I was just doing pre-med. Um, God works in mysterious ways. So scientism is a belief that only science can give, you re can give you an understanding of truth. That only science can accurately describe reality. Only science has the answers. That's scientism. It's not against science, it's just saying that so much of our culture has gone too far in believing science gives you everything you need. That's scientism. That came out of the scientific revolution to a great extent. Okay, so I explained that. Um, but in our belief that the creator and creation is distinct, it means that God intentionally did not make creation to be infinite or eternal or all-powerful. God did not create another God when he created creation. It is a creation is contingent, meaning dependent upon God. Is that clear? And I give you that, I say that, and you, you, you go, ah, duh. And yet there are a lot of people who make statements that violate that, who really do think without realizing it that the creation and the creator are the same thing. Ross? I thought God created the garden needing to be eternal and never dying. And it was sin that brought mortality into the world and the cosmos, and they say, uh, they said, um, and all creation groaned, right. because now it's not eternal anymore. I thought God created the world. I thought when we get to the new heaven, that will be eternal. Well, but the old heaven and the old earth will, will pass, pass away. away. Mm. Okay, will be done away with. And when you, we talk about the Garden of Eden, we don't know exactly how all that worked. All right. When Adam and Eve ate an apple, or well, let's, let's pick something else. When they ate a pineapple, <laughs> let's, let's not get the sin thing into it, okay? When they, when they ate fruit, well, that fruit was, in terms of its material, uh, was destroyed or it was changed or whatever. Animals didn't die. Humans didn't die prior to the fall. Death, in that regard, was introduced at the fall. But still, we don't have, there's not a, a doctrine that the, the gar everything in the Garden of Eden that was created was going to be there forever. The trees would die. The plants, the, the plants apparently would die. 
death for for um, uh, self-aware beings, particularly of humanity. Human beings were intended to live forever. That's true, but you know, there's not too far we can dig into that before to understand God's mind in that regard. But God was not reproducing something that was equal to himself when he made creation. Okay, it's, there is a difference between the creator and the created. And he, he, he made the creation in exact, particularly with a sense that it was not going to be the same as him. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but while God made the creation distinct from himself and not having divine qualities, he did give creation a nature and a functionality that is to be valued as good in itself. There was good. Genesis 1.31, And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Now again, there are a lot of philosophies down through human history that have said that's not true. There were some Greek philosophies, um, Stoicism and some others, that said that the material world is basically an evil. That, you know, you... Your goal is to try to get away from it. Pythagoras believed that. So some ancient Greek philosophies said that the physical world was a burden and an evil, and the goal was to get away from it. Some Eastern philosophies say that the physical world is a punishment. Um, the, the, the Eastern philosophies and religions that believe in reincarnation, the ultimate goal is to not have to come back into the material world anymore. You know, uh, to, to not be reincarnated is some creature that has to live a physical existence because that's perceived as evil. That's not the theory or the, the doctrine of uh, the theology of creation as according to the Hebrew Bible that Judeo-Christianity has. That creation is God made it good. And yes, it's fallen, meaning it's broken, but still there is good in creation for all of its fallenness. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The fact that God has a positive evaluation of creation, that he says it's good, is demonstrated in the fact that he gave the task <coughs> to humanity. Humanity, male and female, he created them, were the highest point of his creation. He made us little lower than the angels, scripture says. And he gave us the job of taking care of all the rest of creation. So he took the highest level of his creation and made us responsible for all the rest of it because it was worth taking care of. And then ultimately the most positive valuation of creation that God could have made was that he himself in the person of his son Jesus Christ became a physical being, a material being. The incarnation of Jesus into the, into the world as a baby is the ultimate valuation of the fact that there is good in the created material world. All right? And again, there are still some philosophies today that say, that, particularly Eastern philosophies now, that say that the material world is an evil that we should try to be getting rid of. And so let's deny it. Asceticism that denies all, all acknowledgement or appreciation for physical needs and that sort of thing, all are based upon the fundamental principle that creation of the created material world is somehow evil. We do not believe that. There is brokenness in it, there are problems with it, but God made it good, and he still values it. Right? Another way in which I think we, we need to see the distinction between creator and creation is that creation, what God made, exists as a contingent rationality. There's a philosophical term for you, contingent rationality, um, in two senses. First. We need to recognize in our theology of creation that God could have made any kind of creation that he desired, or none at all. God was under no obligation to create. He did so because he wanted to. He did so as an outpouring of his own goodness, of his own creative desire, his own love and character, if you will. But the existence of creation of all the created world is entirely contingent upon the desire of God to have done this. It's not a necessary existence. It is contingent. You know the word contingent. It means it relies on something else. All right, got that? So the first one is it relies upon the fact that it was God's desire purely that God wanted to, not because he had to. And creation as it exists is because this is the way God wanted it to be. Yes, it's been broken. But still, the material world is what God wanted it to be. And secondly, 
Not only did creation occur because it was God that desired it, but it still is utterly dependent upon God, not only as the initial creator, but as the sustainer of all creation. If Christ, for instance, the Word of God, the Son of God, stopped sustaining creation, it would cease to exist. It is contingent upon God's desire that it continue. So when we call it a contingent rationality, it means first, it exists only because God wanted it to, not because he had to, and second, it only uh, continues to exist because he wants it to. If we understand those two points, it gives us an understanding of the sovereignty of God, and it gives us a much more accurate evaluation of the nature of the created world as something that is God's desire that he made and that he maintains. The scripture verse I have here, Hebrews 1.3, the sustaining part, people, people might not be sure about, but Hebrews 1.3 says, The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In another place it says it is by the Son that all things are held together. The very matter of creation is sustained as an ongoing active desire by God, particularly as expressed through Jesus the Son. Okay, got that? I told you this class is going to be a little challenging for some of you. But again, once we begin to understand this, it gives us a clearer understanding of what creation is and a clearer understanding of what God did and is continuing to do in creation. That's why it's a theology of creation. All right? Well, why? What is the purpose behind creation? I could give you several reasons why, biblically, I believe that um, God created, why he made the world. The first one is to exhibit his glory, to show forth the fact that he is the great and glorious God who, is, who has the power to do this. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. From the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature have been shown in His creation. Creation declares the glory of God. This is why many of you have heard me say, the greatest failing of humanity, I believe, is not paying attention. Because if we were paying attention, Scripture tells us the very creation around us would declare the glory of God to us. But we don't pay attention. Instead, we look for all sorts of other excuses for how this could be the way it is. So that's the first one, to exhibit God's glory through His created uh, universe. The second, I believe, is to serve as His temple. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 says, This is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things and so they came into being, declares the Lord? Now part of this is reflected in the fact that in ancient religions, and again, other religions had their own creation myths, the suggestion is often made that the, the god Marduk tore Tiamat apart and created the world, and the, the thing he did as soon as the world was created is he went into his temple and sat on his throne in order to be admired by everybody for him having done this. The suggestion is made over and over again that after the act of creation, the creating God would reside in, in the temple in order to be admired and glorified and praised for the act of creation. So uh, scholars with experience in that, say that you, when we read the seven days of creation, six days of actual creative work, and then a seventh day of resting, the Hebrews themselves, the Jews, would probably have read that, that on the seventh day, God entered into his temple, which was the creation, Isaiah 66, and resided there in order to both himself enjoy his creation and also for his creation to give glory to him. And, and we find in Genesis it talks about the sons of heaven, which means the angels at this point, sang songs of praise at the point of creation because of God's great act. So you, you get that idea that the temple 
of God was his created world, the universe that he created, heaven and earth, not all of which we can see. Okay? So that's the second reason. Exhibit God's glory to serve as his temple. Um, the third reason for or purpose for the creation, I believe, is as a created counterpoint to God's own existence. How many of you all paint or do sculpture or something like that? Several of you. Why do you do it? For the enjoyment. To find joy in creating something that is outside you, but that you feel reflects you. In effect, a counterpoint to who you are. It reflects your abilities, your skills, your desire, the way you see the world. It is an external created counterpoint to you as the creator. Now, there is a difference here. When we create, all we do is rearrange materials that already existed. We're going to talk about creation ex nihilo in a minute, creating from nothing, which is God. But um, I think one of the purposes for creation, God created the cosmos, the universe, for the same reason that we create. To have something that was his, was made by him, that reflected his desires as an external counterpoint to what he, he internally uh, felt. Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. God took pleasure. He saw what he had made and he goes, that's good. I like that. That's satisfying for me. Those are the same reasons why humans, as we create whatever medium we use, we create something external to ourselves as a counterpoint to us, but that reflects some aspect of ourselves. I believe that was the, that's why God, one of the reasons God created, he found satisfaction in doing that. A fourth reason that God created was as a platform in which God cre could create life. Isaiah 45 says, it is I who made the earth and created human beings on it. That linking together of creating the location whereby human life could then exist. And then Isaiah 45, for this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He said, I am the Lord and there is no other. God was, God was not lonely. In fact, we have the, the miraculous nature of God being a trinity is he is community within himself, by himself. That's why he could say, let us make man in our own image, because as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he is a community within, him own, with, within his own self. We talked about that under the theology of God. And yet, God desired to extend the relational potential to another being that he would create, which is why humanity was made in the image of God, so that we could relate to God. Now, we were not made divine, we were not made all-powerful, all-knowing, any of those things, but we were made self-aware, we were made creative, we were made with, um, with the ability to choose relationships, uh, the ability to love. There are aspects that God embedded in humanity that are part of his nature, and so in order to create that being with whom he could have additional relationship, because he wanted to, not because he needed to, but because he wanted to, God needed a place to do that. Where was he going to put us? Except that he created a universe that could be inhabited by human beings and by other living creatures that he created. Right? So that's another reason for him creating, is he desired to make life that could appreciate him, worship him, glorify him, that he could be in relationship with. Okay? A fifth reason. God created the universe as an arena in which redemption could occur. Now, there's a mystery in here. People say, well, God created Adam and Eve, and he put that apple on that tree in that garden, and he's all-knowing. He knew they were going to eat it. This was all a setup. No. We've been gypped. No. There is a mystery here. And the way I interpret this mystery, by the way, is there's a beautiful, beautiful passage in Genesis right after Eve takes the apple and eats it and gives it to Adam and he eats it. They realize they're naked. All of a sudden they feel shame for the first time. And they get leaves and they cover themselves and they're hiding from God. And the beautiful part of the story is it says, And the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he called out, Where are you? I read that 
and this is the Ross Arnold interpretation, that even though God was the all-powerful God who had just created everything, including Adam and Eve, even though he is the God that sees everything and knows everything, in a particular way, out of respect for the humans that he had just created to be in a relationship with him, God chose not to spy on them. God chose not to, um, you know, to, to use his super big brother glasses and know everything they were doing every possible second. Otherwise, it makes no sense to say, and Adam and Eve were hiding, and God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he calls out, where are you? Now, that's not the only example that we have in Scripture where God will set aside part of his own power for the sake of humanity. Jesus, when he became incarnate, there is the powerful in Philippians, the powerful what's called the kenosis passage, where it says that Jesus did not uh, hold, uh, he did not grasp to the things of his divinity, but rather set them aside, kenosis, set aside his power in order to be able to relate to us. And so I believe that however we got there, sin, that God from the very start recognized that there was a role for redemption to play, and that this would be the stage on which that redemption gets played out. Okay. Three passages, Romans 8, 20 to 21. For the creation was subjected to frustration, that's the fall, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Another part of the, the theology of creation we don't often think about, we're going to talk about this when we get into the theology of uh, the fall, of the sin, is it wasn't just human beings that fell. All of creation fell when Adam and Eve sinned. The, I, the fact that Adam and Eve were the highest point in creation, the fact that they were given responsibility as the stewards over all creation. When Adam and Eve fell, all of creation fell with them. The idea of natural disasters occurred, started occurring at that point. What's the first thing that God did after he rebukes Adam and Eve and tells them the penalties that they're going to have to suffer because of their fall? What does he do next? Anybody know? Mary? He made them animal skin, so he had to sacrifice the animals. He gave them clothing made from animal skins. So at that point, death entered into the animal kingdom. And it hadn't before. Now, we don't know how God would have used that, because uh, how he, he would have worked that out, because the creation was not eternal. But there was apparently no death amongst the animal kingdom before that as either. And yet, death entered into the animal kingdom at that point in the same way that death entered into uh, human existence. So all of creation fell, and all of creation will be liberated by the redemption that will eventually occur. All right? A second passage, Ephesians 1, 8, the second part of 8 to 10. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Mystery. There is mystery in this. We don't understand it all. Which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times full, reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This idea of things reaching their fulfillment, bringing unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, there is to be a time, an act of redemption, that all of creation, all things, not just people, experience. As part of the, the final scene, if you will, of the created order. And then from Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, not just people, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. All of the created order, all things on heaven and earth. When God created, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, all right, and then it goes on to say, and God created the heavens and the earth. Well, the ultimate reconciliation will be the reconciliation of all things in heaven and on earth. This echoing of the created, creating act will be reconciled to God the Father through the blood shed by Jesus Christ. Not just people, but all of creation will be reconciled. Got that? So, the created order is the place in which the whole act of redemption will ultimately be played out. Those are the reasons I believe that God created. And again, to exhibit his glory, for the created universe to serve as his temple, 
as a created counterpoint to God's own existence, that he took joy in the act of creating, as a platform in which he could create life, and as an arena in which redemption could eventually be played out and, and occur. Any questions about any of that? Well, you guys are easy. Let's talk for a minute about creation ex nihilo. Creation ex nihilo means that, again, different than us when we create, God created from nothing. Ex nihilo. From nothing. God did not take other materials that were laying around, unlike us when we paint or sculpt or do anything else. We take materials that's there and we rearrange them or recombine them in some ways to, to be creative. God did not do that. The gods of the other ancient creation myths, the Enuma Elish and others, they took something that was already there and they created with it. Marduk used Tiamat's body to create the heavens and the earth and the other pieces of creation. Uh, but God, our God, the Creator God, made it from nothing. Genesis 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We're going to talk about that passage, the Spirit of God hovering in a little bit. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And it continues that God creates the physical aspects of the world, the universe. At no point does it suggest, as the other pagan myths do, that God had to gather up some of this waters of chaos. Everything he creates, and then he either speaks things into existence, I'm going to talk about how he creates in just a minute, he either speaks things into existence, or in some cases he takes material that he has already created, and he uses that material to create. But it's all material he created. For instance, it says that, that Adam was created from the dust of the earth. Well, God had just created the dust of the earth, and then he chose to use that material. So he's still creating ex nihilo, because the dust wasn't there before he put it there, before he made it, right? There are some theologians, liberal, very liberal theologians, that have suggested that we should not pursue the doctrine of ex nihilo, or, or ex nihilo, or even talk about it, because it does not say, and when God made this stuff, nothing else had existed before that. It's sort of assumed. But it's a fair assumption. And all the rest of any sort of uh, well thought through and well articulated theology of creation requires that God created from nothing. That is one of the ways in which he is different than any other created act that could have occurred by us or any other being. Yes. Well, that's the essence of creation. It is. I mean, you know, you, if, you, if you didn't create it from, any, from nothing, then it was not a creation. It's a rearranging. It's a rearranging. Well, the, the two reasons why some theologians have argued, some, some liberal theologians have argued that we shouldn't talk about ex nihilo is one, because it doesn't specifically say, and, God, and nothing existed there before and then God made it. And the other reason is, they, is a historical reason. They claim that it, the, first, the first really aggressive articulation of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo was by the Gnostics. They're the ones who really latched onto this to try to use it as leverage to prove some of the other things they said. It's not that the ancient Hebrews didn't deal with this. This is something that came up in, in New Testament times. And the reason is because they didn't feel like they needed to argue about this. It was just a given. You know, they, they, the assumption was there, but they didn't articulate it as a doctrine. Yes, Ron? Is, is there any uh, thing to sort of help with the light being created before the sun? Um, the, no, the, the suggestion, not suggestion, it's saying that there was some source of light that was not the sun or the moon and the star or the stars because they come later. In fact, one of the other arguments is the uh, people look at it and they say, "Well, wait a minute. God created the plants of the earth the day before He created the sun. How does that work?" But but there didn't have to be a source. Well, if He created it, there didn't have to be a source until He 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 chose to operate that that you know solar system. Right. He could do it whichever way, however exactly. He wanted. Exactly. But the the we're told in Revelation that the light in the, the heavenly kingdom will be the light that comes from God, yeah, from right? Mm -hmm. That it will, it will proceed from his throne, you know, from the presence of God, the light that's needed will exist. And so we believe the best explanation is that it was actually the light of the presence of God that he made manifest 
and likely at the same time he created the heavenly realm, which they don't get into. It does say he creates the heavens and the earth, and that that's when the angels came to be. Because later on, we're told that in the process of creation, as God, when God finished the six days of creation, the sons of heaven sang in celebration. So at some point early on there, the angels were made and the heavenly realms were made. But the only answer we really have is that we have other examples where God himself is the source of light and that that light was present even before the sun was made. Okay. Including yeah. the creation of the universe. Yeah, well this is when he says heavens and earth. Uh, the universe, the complete universe. That's, that, heavens and earth is a, is a metaphor, a symbol, symbolic way of saying everything that is. All of existence as we understand it. Okay. Now, I've said this before that um, in terms of creation ex nihilo, there is no explanation apart from the miraculous act of creation ex nihilo to explain how everything came to be. The, there's, there are a number of, of considerations that the evolutionary science, and I, I don't completely reject evolutionary science, we'll talk about that a little bit later because that's part of what I believe is a mature doctrine of creation. I, I believe God did it. That's the thing you need to hear first, that God did it. But the, one of the biggest problems that evolutionists who do not have any, any belief in God have is the Big Bang Theory, which is by far the, the accepted theory for how the universe came into existence. We talked about this before, maybe in this class, I'm not sure. But they'll say, well, there was this infinitely dense speck of matter. And that at, at point, you know, at time zero point nanosecond, it exploded. And as it exploded, it, as, as things do when they explode, it expanded outward. And in the expanding outward of this matter, this incredibly dense, infinitely dense speck of matter, when it exploded and moved outwards, that process created the known universe. And materials from that coalesced to form planets and solar systems and all of that. You know, and, and some of that is argued because, you know, the, the expanding universe. The universe is expanding, apparently. It's, moved, it's moving away from a center. Well, the problem is, science cannot give any explanation, cannot even attempt to give any explanation, for where that infinitely dense speck of matter came from. What was the source of that infinitely dense speck of matter? And why did it explode? There simply is no answer for that. In, in, apart from this idea that there was that matter was created from nothing by God, we have no other explanation for that. There's an extent to which, if, to my mind, God created. If He did it by creating first an infinitely dense speck of matter and then deciding He was going to have that explode, and in that exploding He was going to particularly control how that happened, so that solar systems and planets and life and all the rest of it was going to... If that's how he wanted to do it, then, I mean, he's that good. Because that, to say that is the greatest faith statement I can imagine. All right? If, I, I don't have the details here today, but I'm sure you probably, some of you have probably read. When they look at the statistical probability for life on this planet, we have to, if we were just like 5% closer to the sun or 10% further away from the sun, it couldn't support life here. If we did not have a, the exact parameters of balance of chemicals, then life, as we understand life, could not exist here. And on and on and on and on. The statistical probability, or lack of probability, that all of these elements would come together to create life, to suggest that that's purely chance, is not statistically feasible, really. You know, I, I, I really have thought about this stuff, and I really have tried to open myself to the arguments. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I became a Christian as a young adult. And so I looked at other philosophies, and I looked at science, and I was really serious about this. When I actually started, my mind started developing enough, and I started looking at that, I go, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't wash, guys. The idea that this is all just chance. Now, however God chose to do it, there is intentionality in order to make that happen. And we don't have all those answers. And I'm the first one to say, I'm okay with that, with having mystery. But not knowing all the answers. If I knew all the answers, then I'd be the one doing it, not the one seeing it. Um, did somebody have a comment or question here? Uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Uh, you know, as a young as a young boy, I used to lay in Exposition Park by the Los Angeles Coliseum right. with friends, and we look into the heavens, 
And I would say the one thing that was inconceivable to me was that something didn't have an end. As I looked into the heavens and saw the saw the atmosphere, I thought, if it ends, what comes after? Yep. You know, and in that same vein, it might beg the question, has anybody really examined the question or asked the question, where did God come from? There is no answer to that. Okay. By, by the very nature of God, um, that he is non-contingent. In other words, the thing we talked about, I, the I am, that God is himself um, existent, that he is, but is not dependent upon, did not come from, is not obligated to, is not controlled by, is not limited by, none of the definitions that we have can apply to God in a way that would give us some sense, here's where God came from. Now, and here's the problem, and as a, as a Christian theologian, I confess this problem, and I challenge my, my, my evolutionary science brothers to do the same thing. At a certain point in these kinds of considerations, the ability of the human mind to conceive and the ability of, of, of <coughs> human beings to articulate breaks down. I recognize that. That's why I'm okay with saying there are mysteries. I can be as smart as, as, as anybody. I can think very hard. I can work very hard. I can spend years and years and years. But there is a point beyond which my mind cannot conceive of infinity, for instance. It is not within the capability of the human mind to truly be able to grasp the concept of infinity. If God is infinite, that's why we can't contain God in our perceptions. Mm -hmm. And even much of the extent to which we are able to conceive of things like this, our language is inadequate to articulate it. And we have to just confess those limitations. That doesn't mean we're always happy with it. You know, I would like to be smarter than I am. I'd like to be able to articulate things better than I do. And I'll continue to work at it and do the best I can, but I recognize my own finitude, my own failing. There has to be some humility in here. And if there are, if there are grand failings on the part of religious people or on the part of anti-religious people, both sides, it's that there tends to be a huge lack of humility, an inability to say, I don't know. I don't think you know either, but I don't know. Here's what I do know what I have experienced, what I can rely on. And as I've said, our problem is that we, we, we lose the grasp of the fact that what we do know is more than sufficient to satisfy over against what we don't know. There are questions I don't have the answers to, but the questions I do have the answers to are more than adequate for me to say, this is what I believe. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, the Patristic, patristic, patristic fathers. They said that basically, God has no beginning. Well, wow, that would just fry your circuits. There. Yeah. You know, it has no beginning. But I want to get to this thing about, uh, uh, and I want to suggest something. Um, you, you have the the Babylonian uh, belief of creation, which in its time was legitimate was rational, was embraced by society, by, by an entire empire, and it was looked upon as being just as valid as today our scientists look at this Big Bang Theory. And when you look at them both as options to the alternative that Moses gives us, what makes them any different from one or the other? I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all faith statements, as I say, because of the number of significant questions that evolutionary science cannot answer. I mean, core questions. These are not peripheral issues. The core issues are unable to be answered by evolutionary science. And a, and a humble evolutionary scientist will admit that. Many of them do. But given that, either approach is a faith approach. It really is. And, and the point, uh, you know, I think is worth making is, is that compared to what we've been given in Scripture, Scripture, you know, what Moses gives us really is not just an alternative that you can choose between, between these various opinions. When you, when you look at these other opinions that are extra biblical, um, I have a difficult time putting them in separate categories. They, they all seem to fit in that same category where... Uh, this this one in Genesis uh, is true. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've, some of you heard me say that for me when I became a Christian as a young man, 
part of it was because having studied a lot of philosophy and religion and science as well, I realized that all of them in one way or another are saying basically the same thing. That, it, that in terms of human achievement, human satisfaction, human, you know, the, the goal of human existence, you work and you work and you work and you strive and you strive and you strive and you climb and you climb and you climb up this ladder of achievement or uh, intellectual development or spiritual growth or discipline, whatever it is, whatever measurement your particular philosophy or religion has. And when you reach the top of that, you re get to the pinnacle of achievement in that discipline and you look over, you will experience heaven or nirvana or um, enlightenment or whatever, again, the particular is. There is one exception to that, and this is, this is the, dif the difference, and for me, this made all the difference. There's only one basic belief system that doesn't say that in one form or another, and that is Christianity. Christianity says you can't make yourself better. Yeah, you can get smarter, you can study stuff, you can learn more, you can probably, you know, lose a little weight, you can, you can make yourself a little bit better. But fundamentally, you cannot achieve enlightenment or nirvana or whatever else it is. And knowing that, there is a God who loves you, and since you can't climb up to Him, He came down to you. That's the fundamental difference between Christianity and everything else. There is a God who made you, He desires to be in a relationship with you, but you can't get to Him of your own power, and so he's, He came to you. And that, the fact that that's not like any other belief system is the thing that convinced me ultimately that this is true, that this, this really does work. Now, that plays out in terms of what we're talking about here because since that's the nature of what I believe, there's built into that a sense of humility. I can't save myself. I can't perfect myself. I can't achieve all of what I think humanity is supposed to be for, and so God has done that for me. Well, having admitted that, I then have the comfort level to admit that I also don't know everything. I can't figure out everything. I can't articulate accurately mm -hmm. everything. And I'm okay with that. Again, the, the problem is that by the very nature of the discipline of rationalism and, and scientific inquiry, you don't get a high-level scientist who is, you know, acknowledged for the, to say, well, you know, I don't really know. It doesn't happen very often. A good theologian should always be ready to say, you know, I don't know everything. And yet scientists, the nature of their discipline is that they almost always have to try to come up with an answer. Now, bad theologians always do come up with an answer. And that's why we get wacky ideas and bad theories. And people like the Jesus Seminar saying, well, Scripture says this, but I prefer to think. <laughs> I bust a cork every time I hear that. Becky? Well, I look at it as... Um, God has got a balance. If He, if He allowed us to, to know know it all or be in the same as He is, there would be absolutely no balance if we were a world of billions of know it alls. Who, I mean, how how would you even have a relationship with another person if you felt like you were so much higher than even that person? It would be fighting. Yeah. It would be a, like a world of gods fighting over who's Best. Yeah. I mean, how could you even have life exist? We'd have the pantheon. Well, I think sometimes we, it feels like we do have a world of, I think I know it all. Well, <laughs> but. yeah, but I, I, as far as uh, having a relationship with God, if, yeah. if you thought you were equal to his knowledge and everything, <clears throat> yeah. how could you even have a relationship with him? Yeah, I agree. Bill, did you have something? Yeah, I did. I grew up in a very conservative Christian church. And there's a tendency for them to want to believe this is the way and no more discussion. Can't question it. And, and uh, Southern gospel music, that kind of thing. And, <laughs> you know, that's a sad way to live. Yeah. Well, part of my, the fundamental premise that I have when I, when I go into conversations like this, and I realize I left teaching and went to preaching here just a minute ago, uh, there's a difference. The all truth is God's truth. The God that we believe in and that we say we serve is the master of science as much as he is of theology. All truth is God's truth, and so therefore we should never be fearful of asking these questions. As long as we have the sense in which my faith, my belief system, my structure, my religion, whatever it is, is not going to be destroyed if I run up into a wall and I don't know the answer to that. But no truth, there's no truth outside God's control. There is no truth that's not God's truth. So we need to fairly ask the questions. 
I'm never afraid of anybody asking me a question or me asking a question like, well, how did that work? And, and sometimes Bob Plenke asked the question before class started, what is going on in Exodus with, you know, with Moses headed off to Egypt and God gets mad and wants to kill him and Zipporah you know, circumcises her son and touches Moses' genitals with the foreskin and then God forgave him and then went on about his way. I have no clue what that's about. And I don't think anybody else really does either. Okay? And I'm okay with that. Because that little bitty passage in Exodus does not change what I believe is the reliable aspect of all the rest of that story. So I can ask that question and say, you know, I don't know. That's going to be a good one to ask someday. But there are some people who their whole approach is if we can't come up with some sort of answer, even if it's a really stupid answer for that, then we can't move forward from here. And I don't believe that. One more question, then I need to get back to teaching. Ron? Just to comment that it's very powerful to be well schooled and to say, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, if we say we don't know because we haven't tried, that doesn't have very much credibility. But if we really are struggling with the truth that we know is all God's truth, then I think it's okay for us to say we don't know everything. I'm okay with that. Yes, you can back up a little bit and. When, were the angels, when did the angels come into existence? We don't know for a fact. We assume it is in the first day of creation when God created the heavens. I mean, he created light. It says he created the heavens and the earth. He created light. We do know that it says the sons of heaven, which are the angels, they sang in praise and glory once God finished creation of the cosmos. So someplace probably early on was when they came in. We don't have more detail on that. And again, part of it is that the reason that God doesn't give us a whole lot more detail on some of this stuff is because we don't need to know. I mean, we don't need to preoccupy ourselves with that stuff. People who get so freaked out and hung up about angels and demons and they make up stuff about them, you know, how to email your guardian angel and all that, there's a reason God did not, there was a book on that. I had a bunch, I taught a class on angels and demons and I went to Barnes and Noble and I bought a bunch of books, how to contact your guardian angel and all that stuff. When Carolyn and I moved down here because I wanted to be able to teach Here's some of the crazy, wrong things people are saying. When we moved down here, I wasn't going to give those away to Goodwill or anything else. I destroyed those books because they're horrible. But that's where people go. And the reason why they make all that stuff up is because God did not tell us those details about angels and demons, for instance, for a reason. Because he knew we would get obsessed with it. You know, God does not talk about the devil and the demons more because we already have so much tendency to see a demon under every bush. You've heard me say, oh, I woke up with sniffles this morning. Must be a demon. No, you got the sniffles. Close the window tomorrow night. Okay? And yet human nature is such, we always want to go to that end. And that's why God didn't give us those kind of details. It's bad enough now. Imagine what it would be if he did give us more on that. We focus on that all the time instead of on his son, which is supposed to be the focus. Okay. We're going to take a break. Okay, uh, let's move forward. I want to talk now about the three ways in which God creates. And I'm using the present tense for very particular here. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, the three ways in which God creates. The first way in which God creates is by... De and, and I'm going to unwrap these, unwrap these separately once I give them all three to you. By divine command alone, or what's known as being by fiat... Fiat is not a, a, an Italian car with really difficult maintenance problems. Fiat means a command or act of will that creates something without or as if without further effort. That's what it means to, to create by fiat. The second way in which God creates is by God's two hands. Now this is an expression that Irenaeus, one of the, uh, the early church fathers used, the two hands of God the Father are His Son, the Divine Word, and the Holy Spirit. That God actually works through the Son, the Divine Word, and through the Holy Spirit in creating. I'm going to give you some verses and talk about that. And the third way in which God creates is by what's called ministerial action. I'm introducing you guys to some philosophy and theology words here. Ministerial action means that God empowers some parts of His creation to further create or minister to other parts of his creation. If I am a minister of God, it means God is working through me, hopefully, 
that I, I am representing him in terms of, of it is through me that he's causing things to happen. That's what, what they mean by ministerial action. Now let me get, pick those one at a time and give you some explanation of what I mean. First, creation by divine command alone, which is wrapped up in the ex nihilo idea. That God, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. All God had to do was say it. All he had to do was desire it to be, speak it into being, by fiat, without effort. Again, this is one of the ways in which the Hebrew story of creation differs from all those other pagan stories. The gods had, you know, really had a hard time fighting each other and fighting the chaos and trying to make this into something and really making it difficult. God is portrayed, God the Creator God, Yahweh, is portrayed as having no difficulty at all. He just speaks it into existence. And it is. And then Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Not because he sweated over it. It happened at his command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. <coughs> so God speaks. Nothing had existed. Again, this is next Nihilo passage. And everything comes into being by fiat, without effort or without any appearance of effort. That's one way. Now, most people think about that as being how God created. But the second way in which God created is through his two hands, which are through Jesus, the divine Son, and through the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a couple of passages about that. John 1, this is the Gospel of John, the first chapter, says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, Word. And it's interesting that God said, God spoke the Word at the, at the act of creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Just down below that in the first chapter of John, He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have experienced that. John knew Jesus, who was the Word. Jesus, the divine word, the Son of God, who became incarnate, is co-eternal with the Father from the beginning. And it was through the second person of the Trinity that creation occurred. All right? Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So God the Father acts through his Son Jesus, the incarnate word. Second passage, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is but one God the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom we live, but there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. It was through Jesus, the incarnate word, that creation occurred. So that's another way that God creates, is through the presence of the second person of the Trinity. First, uh, Colossians 1, 15 to 17, again, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created. You may never have thought about the fact that it was Jesus who was the source of all creation. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Remember earlier I talked about that, that God sustains creation. He not, not only created initially, but it is a contingent act of God that all creation is sustained, particularly by the presence of the Holy Word who holds everything together. Right? It's interesting, too, if you've ever studied anything about physics, when they talk about the strong forces and the weak forces and all that, that the... The forces at the atomic level, they, and they talk about quarks and stranges and, you know, neutrons and all kinds of, you know, uh, very strange stuff. And one of the things that, that scientists will say is, you know, we don't really know what holds an atom together. Yeah. We don't understand the force. It's a mysterious force. That's why some of these particles are called stranges and things like that, because we don't know what causes the molecular world, the atomic world, to stay in one place. And yet, it takes a lot of effort to tear an atom apart, and when you do, the results are pretty cataclysmic, as you well know. That's where atomic bombs come from. And I think it's beautiful that, that Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. I take that as 
an indication of how it is that all of this stuff, beyond the ability of science to understand, all of it holds together. So God acts first through fiat, or creates first through fiat, through speaking a command. Secondly, he works through his first hand, which is Jesus, the, the divine word. He also creates through the spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Genesis 1, I, I used this before, the second verse. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Actually, the first reference to the Trinity in the Bible is in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. God said, so there is God the Father, He spoke the Word, which is the Son, and then the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters in the second verse. And so the spirit was participating in creation, in other words. When you send your spirit, Psalm 104, they are created, meaning the beings of the world, and you renew the face of the ground. The spirit comes and creates. 1 Peter 3 says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Creating life is part of the creative act. And the Spirit is involved in that. And then we say in the Nicene Creed, and you may not have noticed it, we use the, the Nicene Creed once a month here, the Apostles' Creed we use once a month. Nicene Creed says, We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The giver of life. Creation occurs through the Spirit, as well as through God's fiat and through God the Son. Okay, questions about any of that? Those, Irenaeus called the divine word, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the two hands of God that he often uses in the act of creation. The third way in which God creates is by ministerial action, which I defined for you as working through um, God using part of his creation to then manifest other parts of his creation. Genesis 1.11 says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation. He doesn't say... Let there be this vegetation. He says, let the land produce vegetation. Hmm. God made part of creation, which then that part of creation was responsible for producing other parts of creation. Seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit and with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. And God says again, shortly after that, in Genesis 1.24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to his kind, and it was so. Similarly, God made uh, Adam out of the dust of the earth. Well, he made the dust of the earth, and that was the material from which he created humanity. Psalm 104 comes to this. The whole Psalm 104 is a creation psalm. The whole thing is about God's creative act. Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15. He, that is God makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth fruit from food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. I don't know if you ever thought about the fact that um, my body produces new cells, right? You slough off skin, you cut your hair, you know, your hair grows, that there's a constant act of creation going on. Well, how does that happen? Well, God made me, he created me with that ability, and then he created the food and the sunlight and the oxygen and all the other things that I have to have in order to facilitate that act of creation which is ongoing in me and in you. So that's the ministerial action, that God uses part of his creation in order to facilitate either the initial creation, in the case of Genesis 1, or the ongoing aspect of creation, as he moves forward. And that idea of creation being ongoing is the next point I want to make. And we don't often think about that. We think Genesis, you know, the first three chapters of Genesis, uh, we get the creation and the fall, right? And yet, if you study, if you have a mature theology of creation, you have to see that God's creation did not stop when he rested on the seventh day. He set it up so that creation is ongoing. Um, by continuing uh, creation's ministerial action, again, God said, let the land produce. The, the analogy or example I give you of my body creating new cells of human women with the assistance of their husbands, creating new, new life in babies, 
Creation is still occurring because that's the way God designed it and God facilitates it through ministerial action. None of it happens apart from us. You, you've heard me say that the, the fourth, I believe the uh, fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, is actually still about God. That's not one of the commandments about how we relate to other people. It's how we relate to God because that's a passage about the fact that God ultimately is in control of even our biology. And then he created us by putting parents there. He sustained us by having parents there to feed us and take care of us when we weren't able to. So I believe that the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, is actually a commandment about God. So the first five commandments are about God, and the second five are about our relationship with other people. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie, you know, don't covet. But that's an example. The fifth commandment is an example of God's continuing creation through ministerial action, through our parents particularly. The second way in which I believe God's creative activity is ongoing is that he continues to sustain and give order to the structure of, of creation. Um, Hebrews 1.3, I, I used this earlier, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So again, not, not only is there still creation happening, but God is keeping things in line. He's, he's, he's keeping them together, he's keeping them ordered, he's keeping them moving forward in the way they need to. It's sustaining them. In Psalm 139, you've probably heard this verse and not thought about it as part of a theology of creation. For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Well, now this passage was written, was written down 500 years after the creation passage was written down, and the creation passage was talking about something that happened long before it was written down. Why am I saying that? When the writer of Psalm 139 says, you knit me together in my mother's womb, what he's saying is, you're still creating, God. You didn't stop at the end of day six. You made me. I'm a product of your ongoing creation. So God's creation has not stopped. It continues to be manifest. Yes, he, bit, he, he created the big structure and all the various types and you know, uh, humanity and animals and plants and the seas and the skies and heavens and the earth and all of that he created in the initial act of creation. But then he continues to sustain, to order, to maintain, to move forward on his creation on an ongoing basis. Does that make sense? God's creation is ongoing. Now, why does this matter, the theology of creation? I want to give you several reasons now as to why I think it's critically important that we have a, a well-articulated theology of creation. More so than just, well, God made it. We think he made it in six days and he made it out of nothing. That's as far as most Christians today, their theology of creation goes. We need to be a little more, sensitive, a little more thoughtful than that because for these reasons. Uh, first... I believe that we need to understand, and some of you have heard me say this before, I, this was part of a devotion I did at the men's group, for instance. There are two great pillars that we need to, to understand as being fundamental, foundational to our relationship with God. And those two pillars are creation and redemption. If we have a right understanding of creation, and we have a right understanding of redemption, then we're going to have a pretty clear picture of God. Because God made us, and He redeemed us. And both of those things give Him a claim on us. Our relationship to God is built upon the fact that we were made by Him, and we were redeemed by Him. E. Stanley Jones, the missionary, told a story about a young boy who lived in New York, and again, I told this story at the men's group, uh, men's breakfast. E. Stanley Jones says this boy, um, he loved boats. And so he spent weeks and weeks and weeks making this little sailboat. And he very carefully created it, made sails for it and everything else. And he takes it out into Central Park, into one of the lakes in Central Park, and he puts it on the water, and the sails are up, and the wind catches the sails and starts blowing it across the lake. And as it's getting a distance away from him, he realizes he had not thought of a way to get it back. And so he lost his boat that he had worked for weeks and weeks and weeks making. 
Well, a couple weeks later, he's walking down the street in New York, and he glances over, there's a pawn shop, and there's his boat sitting in the window. Someone had gotten it and taken it to this pawn shop. Well, he goes into the man and says, that's my boat. I made that boat. And the owner of the pawn shop said, well, I'm sorry, but I paid somebody else for that. I can't just give it to you. You're going to have to buy it. So the boy goes home and asks his dad for some money, and he collects all the money he can in his coins, and he comes running back, and he pays the, the shopkeeper for the boat. And he takes it, and as he's walking out of the shop, he said, okay, little boat, you are now mine for two reasons. I made you, and I bought you with a price. That's God's claim. God has a claim on us because he made us, and then he redeemed us for a price. If we're missing half of that, then we have only half of an understanding of what the nature of relationship is between God and humanity. Creation is critical to that. Right? The second reason I believe that a, a theology of creation is important is a proper theology of creation assures us not only that God acted in the past, in space and time, but that he continues to act by creating and sanctifying his works in space and time. Back to that point that God has not stopped creating. Too many people have this sense, which is deism actually, Deism says God, there may be a God who really created everything, but then he went to Cancun and we haven't heard from him since. He's not available to us anymore. A proper theology of creation includes the sense in which God is still present, he is still active, he is still creating and sustaining his creation on an ongoing basis. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you, you notice the present tense works in you, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Not God worked in you and now you're on your own. God works in you now, ongoing. And then 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is in the Spirit. Again, we are being transformed now. God is still working in his creation to transform us into the form we're supposed to be in. Our whole understanding of God's presence in the world, in other words, is affected by how we perceive the theology of creation. It hasn't ended yet. God is still acting in, in, in acts of creation. The third reason I think in, uh, theology of creation is important is that a good theology of creation is the very best response to scientism and the science-based rejection of faith. I am not against science. I love science. Science is God's as well. God is in charge of science. All truth is God's truth. Scientism, again, is the sense in which science is the only way that we can gain knowledge or have understanding or, or perceive any truth through science and rationality. And that's scientism is the reason that so much of science has chosen to reject faith as a legitimate option. Now, I'll give you a couple, three reasons actually why I think that's true. First, we believe that creation has functional integrity. That means it works in a reasonable way. We sometimes talk about natural law, you know, cause and effect. These are the things science studies. That's what science is about. It's studying the realities of how things work. Well. If we have a sense, a mature sense of a theology of creation, then we, as people of faith, see creation as having a functional integrity, natural law and causal nature in the created universe. And that's not an argument, as it sometimes is with scientism, against God. They say, well, you know, things just happen. It's causal, and it's natural law, this is just the way things are made. Instead, if we have a mature theology of creation, our statement is yes. There is natural law. There is cause and effect. There is a causal relationship between things. There is a functional integrity, but it's not accidental. In fact, as our understanding of functional integrity and creation matures, we have a, we have a, a better a grasp and articulation of a theology of creation, we're able to say everything is so reasonable, so orderly, so rationally contingent and intelligible, we, we can argue that that is itself not an argument against God, but an argument for God. That is our response, that yes, the systematic way in which everything is put together and works is a sign 
of God's involvement in that, of his creation initially and his ongoing creation. And as I say, the study of regularities in the created world, which is the job of science, exactly points to a sense of God's having placed those characteristics in creation. It has been said, I'm not a statistician, but I have read in several times, that a statistician worked out that for all of creation to fit together as cleanly and well as it has, I gave an examples a few minutes ago of how unlikely statistically it is that we can survive as, as life on this earth, but one analysis by a statistician said that for things to have been created, for the human life especially to be created as it is, by accident, or to have occurred by accident, would be statistically comparable to a tornado blowing through a junkyard and after it passed over, there's a fully finished and operational 747 jet sitting there. <laughs> there's a point at which the very nature of what science says are accidental natural law becomes, in a mature theology of creation, part of the reason why we believe in God. Okay. A second reason is a mature theology of creation gives us the basis for rightly understanding miracles. Now, since the scientific revolution, miracles have traditionally been defined as any violation of natural law. Okay? Natural law, the way things are supposed to occur, when, when that doesn't happen, it's a miracle. Okay? Or at least that's what they accuse us of believing. Okay? That, that um, if I curse you and lightning strikes you right then, you know, that does not seem to fit with natural law. That must be a miracle. So the point is that since the scientific revolution, the idea is that natural law has to be completely violated for something to be miraculous. But that's only been since the 18th and early 19th century that people thought of that as a miracle. Miracles prior to that, based primarily on Augustine, who was one of the early church fathers, a miracle was anything that occurred that led us to awe and wonder. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, Arturo's being healed. Okay. His body is naturally healing itself. We believe that God is blessing him. God created his body in such a way that his body can heal itself. That's part of that, uh, the idea of a continuing creation, if you will. That his body was designed and created in such a way that it can produce the cells it needs to repair itself, etc. But suppose Arturo, um, when he had been in the hospital and his kidneys were giving him difficulty and he had the, the nephrostomy tube in, if we had clapped our hands and he no longer had the wound, he no longer um, had any pain, he no longer had any blockage in his urethra, that all of that stuff happened that fast. The thing is, it is happening now by what scientists would say is natural order. If God had chosen to do that instantaneously, it would not have been a violation of natural law, it would have been an acceleration of natural law. You see my point? Any, our bodies were made in such a way, and science accepts this, that we have the ability to heal. But when we get healed instantaneously, they call it a miracle. When in fact, that's not a violation of natural law. All it is is an acceleration of natural law. Our understanding of miracles does not require us to believe that all natural law, all scientific understanding, all cause and effect relationship has to be set aside. It may just be that a miracle is an acceleration or some other uh, effect that causes us to go, wow. Look what God did. It's a much healthier understanding of, of the miraculous. So a mature theology of creation gives us a better understanding of what a miracle really is. It is anything that God does that causes us to look to him in awe and wonder. It doesn't have to be a setting aside of the natural law. You get that? Does that make sense? It's good. And the third reason why I think that theology of creation, a mature theology of creation is the best response to scientism, is that it helps us to understand God is still being active in his creation, not just when he chooses to intervene miraculously. Whether it's a miracle or not, God is still creating in the world, 
and that's one of our responses. I, I can look at a thousand things and say, this is God's continuing act of, of creation. The unfolding of time and seasons that allow us to you know, plant crops, to sleep, to wake. Um, the provision of crops and other food naturally for us. The natural healing from disease I mentioned. Even microevolution. You know what microevolution is? Darwin, when he went to um, the Galapagos Islands, one of the things that he observed, that he made a big deal about, was that finches that were of the same basic family of finch lived on different islands. On some of those islands, they had their food was primarily very hard seeds and nuts that were very hard to crack. Those finches had developed very sturdy beaks, you know, like sort of vice grip beaks, so they could break those nuts. There were other places where these same finches lived in places where the seeds that they got were down inside plants. And so they developed longer beaks that they could reach inside those plants. That's an example of microevolution, where minor modifications occur in animals in order to be able to help them survive. Um, another thing with the evidence has been shown that moths that live in highly polluted areas, they tend to develop darker coloration so that they blend in with soot-covered trees instead of being white and being really obvious so the birds eat them all. Those are examples of microevolution. Now, you can say, oh, evolution. You know what? That's exactly an example, perhaps, but it certainly fits the definition of the way in which God would continue to work in his creation in order to make his creation viable. God has not stopped creating these small variations that make animals more successful are exactly examples of a mature theology of creation. Now, the thing is that evolution, the whole missing link thing, there has never been a demonstration of speciation, which is macroevolution. Macroevolution says that a whole new species is created from another species. For instance, the theory is that all birds evolve from lizards. Okay? We have no examples of that. There is one fossil, which most, most scientists have to confess they think is probably faked, which seems to show characteristics of both one, I mean literally one, which seems to show examples of both lizard and bird. But the, the guy who, who found it, had it, sold it for a lot of money, you know, it's believed he may have found a way to fake this. So, whether he did or not, you know, is not the point. But there are no examples, other than that one questionable one, of any new species having evolved from a lesser species. The famous missing link. Where is the connection between primates and human beings? Now, you know what? I'm open to saying that maybe in some way God did use primate biology to create human beings. If he did it, and that was his plan, and that's what he wanted to do, and God was entirely in control of it, it wasn't accidental. He didn't go to Cancun, and this happened while he was gone. He came back and said, dang, that's kind of strange. No, that's not what we believe. However he did it, we believe God created humanity. The fact is we have no examples of one species being able to track into evolving into another species at all. That's macroevolution, big evolution. Microevolution is actually, I believe, consistent with God's ongoing creation, acts of creation. So we get, I think we, we need to have a little more thoughtfulness about that. Know a little bit more what we're talking about when we talk about evolution and things like that. Because it could very well be that this is a sign of God's work in terms of the microevolution examples. Rather than us freaking out every time somebody suggests something like that. All right? You understand where, what I mean by that? Okay. All truth is God's truth. We may not have all the answers, but all truth is God's truth. And then, a fourth reason I think that uh, theology of creation is important, is that a good theology of creation, uh, creation allows us to perceive and appreciate that God continues to produce variety, creativity, and beauty for our benefit, and for us to appreciate, and because of that, I believe if we're paying attention, remember the greatest failing of humanity, if we are paying attention to God's ongoing creation, and that's part of the definition of having a mature theology of creation, then that should lead us into a deeper sense of gratitude and sincere acts of praise and worship. 
when I see the miraculous thing that God not only had created in the past, but the things he's creating now, the blossoms on flowers, the buds on the trees, the fact that I ate a really good apple about five months ago, and I thought, man, this is a good apple. I'd love to have an apple tree like this. And just on a whim, I took two or three seeds and stuck them down in the pot, and it's now that tall. That's part of God's ongoing act of creation. And I am just in awe that he did that, and especially that he did that for me. I, I praise him for that. But I have to have a mature sense of a theology of creation in order to be able to make that connection and go back to the fact that that little apple tree is God's gift to me. Praise God. Yeah. All right? That's why we need, a, I believe, a much more mature theology of creation than what most Christians today have. And most of that is based in the, in the Old Testament. You know, the creation of Genesis and the reiteration of that through Psalms and others, but then it's fulfilled and manifest in the Incarnation. And, you know, God's sort of complete acknowledgement of the goodness of the material world that he created by allowing his son to come in that form. Questions or comments? Yes, Chris? Um, on the miracles and the, you know, God's creation is moving more rapidly. Is that to, would you say that all miracles are like that? Or are there some miracles that are just supernatural? No. Some miracles are a setting aside of the, of the laws of nature. All right? But the, the definition of saying that a miracle is anything that causes us to have awe and wonder at God's works, that fits all categories. Whereas the definition of miracle, which has existed since the scientific revolution, that a miracle by definition is something that sets aside the natural law completely, I don't think is necessary. And, and there are reasons why, um, why we see that as an act of God. For instance, in the Bible it tells us to um, not, not get involved in witchcraft, not to seek magical answers to things. Most people in the 21st century say, well, that's because that's not, you know, without thinking about it, their assumption is, well, that's because magic isn't real. You know what? It is real. If by real we mean that there are supernatural things happening in the world, that there is supernatural potential in the world. I believe the reason God tells us not to mess around with magic is because magic is an effort to set aside the natural law that God created for the sake of accomplishing something that we want. I want to say a magical spell in order to get this person to like me, even though they've already told me they hate my guts, or whatever it is, all right? You know, the, the love potion, or whatever. To set aside reality as we understand it exists by some supernatural means in order to accomplish what we want. Well, God, I believe, says don't do that because he's saying, I put the natural law in place for a reason. If, the, if natural law did not exist, you could not survive. If I had planted that apple tree seed, that apple seed, instead of coming up as an apple, if it had come up as a magnolia, if I planted corn because I needed corn to feed my family, and gardenias came up, if every time I threw a light switch instead of the lights coming on, some house in Riberas blows up, and somebody dies, in, in other words, if, I, if cause and effect if natural law, if a reasonable, you know, events following causal uh, activities, if that wasn't in place, we couldn't survive. And God, I believe when he says, don't try to find supernatural answers to things on your own that violate natural law or cause and effect, it's because that's necessary for our survival. But what God says is, if you find yourself in a situation where there is not a natural law kind of solution, and yet you feel a desperate need, like somebody I love is sick, and the doctors don't know what to do about it, God has said, don't try to use magic, don't try to find your own supernatural solution to that, but you can come to me, because you, you're not wise enough, smart enough, you know, you're not on top of it enough to know how to deal with those supernatural things. You're going to screw it up and you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. But God says, but I can do that. Come to me and ask me. And I can set aside the natural law for your benefit if it is the right thing to do. It may not be the right thing to do and we don't always see that. We've been praying for healing for, for Arturo. 
and he is being healed. Because God, I believe, has both made his body in such a way that it can heal itself, and God has also continued to heal him. He's prevented it from getting worse. He's making it better. Sometimes those healing is miraculous. So God has said, come to me if you have a need that cannot be answered within the bounds of natural law. And if it is the right thing, if it's within my will, I will respond. But don't you try, because you're not that smart, or that wise, or that good. But that doesn't mean it's because there's not supernatural capabilities out there that could set aside the natural law. Fair? Um, just this morning I was reading on the Drudge Report about a young man, 23 years old in Nebraska, that uh, had a, an infection, a toxic blood poisoning, and it led to acute myocarditis. Mm -hmm. And uh, he became unconscious and he, he was, uh, his, his heart was shutting down. He's 23 years old. And the doctor said he's terminal. And they put him on a list for, for a heart uh, transplant and they finally got a heart, a heart to be able to, uh, that was, uh, that could serve this young man, only to find out he was too sick to have it. And it was a, such a disappointment to his, his parents. This article goes on to say that, that uh, in a matter of hours, the doctors began to notice, after the announcement of that, began to notice that this young man's blood pressure was increasing and was improving. And in a matter of days, what was he was laying on his deathbed. Now he's completely healed, which was uh, has stunned the doctors. And so, uh, and he ha does not need. I mean, it, it's just it's just amazing. This article. Um, it said, uh, uh, he was on a full heart and lung machine. Needed daily blood transfusions. Um, and. Uh, he says what happened next was a rapid succession of improvements as his body began fighting off the blood infection. Nobody can say, surely say how it happened, but doctors said his heart slowly began working again. And, uh, and his heart was completely healed and the doctors themselves, uh, it's quoted, they said, this is a miracle. And so those things still happen today. They well, happen today. Um, I think whether it is a, an inexplicable, you know, miraculous, to use that word, um, event that the doctors did not expect, or even if it was simply that over a period of time his body healed itself. Well, the, the, impression, the impression here is that it was sudden. Yeah, well, exactly. I, and and I, I understand that. But even if it hadn't been, but he slowly had gotten better over a period of time, the problem is that even as Christians, we stop recognizing that, even, that any yeah. ability of the body to right. heal itself in a mature theology of creation is God's ongoing work of yeah. healing and creating and mending and building. Okay, yes. uh, Isaiah 40, passage that says um, that they will mount up with wings like eagles, they will run and not be weary, they will walk and not faint. I heard an interpretation of that one time that I absolutely love as being the three ways in which God can be active in our lives when we have, when we have needs. Um, they mount up on wings like eagles. Is an example of God miraculously healing. You know, that he can he can do a miracle like this guy. They will run and not be weary. Can be an analogy for the fact that people may be healed over a period of time, perhaps with the assistance of doctors or with medicines. It's not going to be an instantaneous thing, but they will get better. And the third way, they will walk and not faint may be a sign that for some of us, like for the Apostle Paul, Sustaining. we are going to have, we are going to continue to have that pain or that ailment or that illness or that difficulty, and that, and yet God will allow us to live with it, as He did with Paul. You know, Paul said, "I asked God three times to take this thorn in my flesh away," and He said, "No, because you know my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness." And God did not remove. That whatever that physical problem was that Paul had. So for some of us, what it is, is we will walk and not faint. We will continue to live with the disabilities or pain that we experience, but God will sustain us in that. All three of those are examples of God's miraculous working. And yet we want the lightning bolt right now. Because partly, I don't think we have a mature sense of God's work continuing to work in His creation. We don't have a mature theology of creation. Okay? Questions or comments? 
One, one last statement I, I do want to make. Um, from time to time, as I talk up here, and, and I'm sure you can tell this, I have my notes and I do all the work and everything, but when I start talking, I go all over the place. And sometimes, I've gone back and watched some of the tapes, which is very painful for me, um, <laughs> in order to see what they are. And from time to time, I will have a slip on something where, where the connection between my brain and my mouth isn't quite right. Example was, I was watching it the other day, and I meant to say that 3,000 3, years ago, the Israelites something. And I said, well, 1,000 years ago, the Israelites, well, no, it wasn't 1,000 years ago. And there was one, John, that you caught me on recently, where I said, I uh, was showing you a map, and I pointed to Susa. And I said, Susa was where uh, the Jonah was going. And you said, no, Jonah was going to Nineveh. I knew that. And I went, ah, oh, of course. And I'm, I was struggling because I immediately knew you were right. I was thinking, what was I thinking about Susa? Susa is where Esther was. All right? All right. So, because of the way I teach, if you ever catch me saying something that's not accurate, if I say, well, you know, a thousand years ago is the Israelites, as they were entering uh, the, the land of Canaan, go, excuse me, did you really mean a thousand years ago? You think we're or, to or what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> forgive me when I make those slips. You wouldn't even know when. Uh, but, you know, I, I, forgive me for that, and also don't, don't ever be reluctant to straighten me out if you catch me on one of those. Or even if I'm just wrong. Okay, that's the humility part. Were you a politician? We have fact checkers. Working. Exactly, fact checkers. You have video <laughs> files now. So, all right. Thank you all. God bless you. I'm letting you out four minutes early so you can go party. Homework. Oh, homework. Oh, homework. <laughs> uh, yes. yes.